Gentlemen, what feelings can a man experience when his wife cheats on him? Probably not the best, but you will feel even worse when you find out that your best friend is involved in this betrayal. So, gentlemen, the story is about one adultery on a sunny Sunday. I arrived in my wife's car for a couple of new lawn chairs, fulfilling this assignment. I decided to turn on the program This American Life on the NPR channel and immerse myself in the fascinating stories they offered. As I was driving, a book mentioned on the radio caught my attention, forcing me to write down its title. Holding onto the steering wheel with one hand, I rummaged in the center console with the other, feeling for the handle under the CD cases. A number of random objects emerged from the depths, a crumpled honey wrapper, a folded Starbucks drink package, a quarter, even a folding comb. But among this assortment, my fingers came across something unmistakably recognizable, a distinct package of contraceptives. I was startled by the surprise and loosened my grip on the steering wheel for a moment, almost driving off the road. It is such moments that are imprinted in memory, replayed in seemingly endless slow motion. With each frame, a red Toyota sweeps by to my left, driven by a red-haired girl with an earring in her ear. Returning my gaze to the road, I noticed that the speedometer needle was confidently holding at 34 miles per hour. Dust particles settled on the dashboard, reminding me that time is passing. Anticipating the approaching green light, I felt a sense of confidence. On the underside of the windshield, a collection of crushed beetles is visible, evidence of past trips. But when I took out the CD case, its jagged edges scratched my wrist, catching me off guard. Unexpected sensations interrupted the course of my thoughts, preventing me from maintaining clarity of mind. Against the background of this confusion, the question arose, have I ever asked myself the question, is this mine? Has the thought of infidelity ever crossed my mind? Thoughts, unlike images, tend to be messy and confusing. Maybe you were worried about the guilt caused by the fact that you accidentally revealed a potentially dark secret. Or maybe you were overcome by fear. Maybe you doubted that you did something wrong. I thoroughly searched every corner of the car, starting with the glove compartment and ending with the trunk. I even opened all the doors and examined the seats. Finally, my efforts paid off when I found a small package under the passenger seat, cleverly hidden in a plastic bag from the supermarket. Carefully unwrapping it, I found a small spiral-bound notebook. My heart began to pound in my chest as I opened it and began to unravel the contents. The first two pages were left blank, and I was intrigued. But when I moved on to the following pages, I was met by a number of mysterious lists. 4, 27, height 135, above 1 chi, 1156 TL, 1511 TL2. After meticulously counting the notes in my notebook, I realized that there were 32 of them, made over four months with an interval of about four to five days. The last entry indicated the next day, tomorrow, 8, 29. Curiously, one of the entries was crossed out, which caught my attention. Under other circumstances, I might not have paid attention to these lists and would not have thought about their meaning. But then, a familiar picture began to emerge, the schedule of my business trips for work. The crossed-out date caused me to understand, it was the day I got sick and had to stay at home. Unexpectedly discovered earlier, the contraceptive seemed to convey a message directing my thoughts towards the hotels I often visited during trips, Holiday Inn, Quality Inn. In the process of solving the clues, all the pieces began to add up into a single whole, indicating a scheduled meeting at the travel lodge or holiday in the next day at exactly 1.30. This revelation struck me with a mixture of horror and disbelief. I was desperately hoping that my assumptions were wrong, that there was some alternative explanation. But the presence of this contraceptive as an indisputable witness seemed to confirm the worst-case scenario. I had to admit the harsh truth. It turned out that my wife had a constant affair that lasted four months. This caused me to lose all hope that this was just an isolated incident. The evidence showed that she really cheated on me, and not just like that, but with serious intentions. I had an uneasy feeling she kept a secret of an evasive list. This revelation hit me like a brick. Deep down, I knew that I was on the verge of losing her, and at the same time, conflicting emotions were raging in me. On the one hand, I could not deny the accumulated resentment and anger towards her, considering her unworthy and not worthy of attention. But on the other hand, there was still love in my heart, and it was incredibly difficult to let it go. The difficult task of confronting her loomed before me, 
and I could not get rid of the thought that I would have to face this painful truth. The very thought of having to deal with the consequences filled me with fear. Questions were spinning in my head. How can I find someone else? At that moment, I shook my head, closed my eyes, and realized that I was completely lost. Doubts crept into my head. Was she involved in something illegal? Was she running a secret business on the side? Why would she keep such secrets? What if her affection switched to another man or even a woman? Uncertainty and confusion overwhelmed me, and I became entangled in a web of emotions. Not having enough information about the situation, I felt completely at a loss how to approach her and start a conversation. Thoughts of what she might say raced through my mind. Will she express remorse by saying these words, I'm sorry, my love. I didn't want you to find out about it. Please find the strength in your heart to forgive me. I have to leave you because I made a serious mistake. Or maybe there will be blackmail in her explanations, the statement that she was forced to have an affair with an unknown man. Or maybe she will shift the blame onto me, saying that my absence and suspicions of infidelity pushed her to seek revenge. The possible scenarios seemed endless, and I wasn't sure what she could really say. In the midst of this crisis, a startling discovery was revealed to me. She found out about my infertility and, in search of pregnancy, slept with my own brother. Just this thought sent goosebumps down my spine, emphasizing the depth of secrets and deception that were embedded in our relationship. Am I infertile? Why not reveal everything? Do I have supernatural powers as a vampire? Do I work undercover as a secret agent and the nature of my mission is strictly classified? But, dear, I want you to understand that I am doing this only for the sake of my country. I carefully return the contraceptive and the notebook to their place. When you are overcome by deep sadness, the lower part of your face seems to be attracted to the earth, as if gravity holds it more strongly. I was at a loss what to do or think. I had read enough about infidelity to understand that a woman can have an affair because of her own misfortune, and this suggested that perhaps I was, to some extent, to blame for this situation. My sense of self remained intact. It wasn't the end of my life. I experienced mixed emotions, resentment, anger, sadness, confusion. And in those dark hours, I wondered if I had made the wrong choice in life, if I was inherently flawed, if I needed to turn into someone else. That night, I put on the mask of a familiar person. When Sherry tried to start a conversation about a book she was reading, I pretended to be focused on work, saying that I had a difficult week ahead and I couldn't get rid of anxiety. I'm sorry, my love. I feel a bit withdrawn, I said. She retired to the bedroom to immerse herself in reading. Meanwhile, I was cleaning the dishes and doing household chores. I even stayed there until she fell asleep. The next morning, I hurriedly got dressed, left the house, and drove without leaving the car. By ten in the morning, I drove up to the old Holiday Inn. Unlike modern establishments, this hotel allows guests to park their cars next to the rooms, bypassing the entrance to the hotel through the lobby. In moments of despair, you have to act outside the box. I must admit that I don't know how to cheat. Instinct compels me to tell the whole truth, and this tendency, as a rule, benefits me in my work. Sharing information creates a sense of connection, allowing others to genuinely get attached to me. Or maybe they just pretend to be friendly in order to gain additional knowledge. Ideally, I hope that everything will happen according to the first scenario. However, I have long since given up the idea that business contacts can be considered real friends. Hello, I greeted the receptionist. I think my wife has to meet someone here at 1.30. His reaction was subtle. I suspect that she may be having an affair, and I would like to find out the identity of her companion. A skeptical expression appeared on his face. I just want to see the surveillance footage. His doubt was obvious. I'm afraid I can't grant you access, sir. With all due respect to you, there are doubts about your intentions. This hotel is responsible for the safety and privacy of its guests, not for your personal investigations. There is a possibility that you may pose a threat to this woman. I apologize for assuming that she is your wife without getting confirmation, as my first boss said. When I enter uncharted territory, additional time should be allocated, since rarely everything happens as expected. If my life were a detective novel, I could slip a $20 bill to the desk clerk unnoticed to gain access, but I'm not one to resort to such tactics. 
On the contrary, as an experienced negotiator and manager, I am able to find mutually beneficial solutions. The receptionist and I struck up a conversation, and soon he realized that it would be beneficial for the hotel if I watched the security monitors in his presence, ensuring transparency of my actions. Realizing that if I left, I would be able to monitor the territory outside the hotel, and he would be powerless to prevent any unpredictable actions. Such a scenario could lead to legal consequences for the hotel. So, it became obvious that, to reduce the risk, it was necessary to keep me on the hotel grounds. I find great satisfaction in reaching agreements that satisfy both sides. As a gesture of goodwill, I treated us to lunch at Subway, choosing for myself a classic sub with tuna, and for him, chicken with bacon and ranch. After parking the car on the other side of the street, I went back to the hotel, and we watched the local news together at noon. During our communication, I openly shared information with him, discussing details related to the notebook and contraceptives. During our conversation, he talked about his personal life, sharing stories about his family, including his nephew's imprisonment and his father's health problems. While enjoying the sandwiches, we started a conversation about fat calories and various eating methods, during which he mentioned his attempt to follow the Atkins diet. We agreed that the most difficult aspect of any diet is maintaining the achieved weight. It was as if we quickly became friends, knowing that our paths would most likely never cross again. Exactly at 12.50, she arrived. After parking the car at the back entrance, the farthest from the street, she remained sitting inside, engrossed in a telephone conversation. I could clearly see her face through the monitor. After finishing the conversation, she looked at her reflection in the rearview mirror, absently twirling a strand of hair in her hands. Suddenly, at exactly 1.30, an elegant blue BMW stopped next to her on the driver's side. A tall gentleman with a shock of brown hair got out of the car. He walked easily to the hotel entrance, handed over the room key, and looked back in the direction of my wife. In response, Sherry opened the car door, took one last look at her reflection, and confidently walked towards the man waiting for her. As she passed him, he gently wrapped his arm around her waist, pulling her to him. The hotel door closed behind them, sealing their private moment. I have never used the term cuckold, neither in ordinary conversation nor when it came to a man who was cheated on by his wife. The concept of this word had not occurred to me before. Its origin is connected with the behavior of the cuckoo bird, which lays its eggs in the nests of other birds. An unsuspecting host bird raises a cuckoo chick, which eventually outgrows the nest and occupies a dominant position in it. Although I had no reason to suspect that Sherry was carrying another man's child, I couldn't shake the feeling of betrayal akin to a cuckold. At best, she was just dating a man I didn't know, maybe someone she met at the gym or through mutual acquaintances. Initially, a casual romance, which intensified over time but may have already lost momentum, was never built on love. The idea of an affair is easy to understand, we all used to be fond of it. But with effort and time, you can recover from such an affair. By acknowledging your pain and recognizing the underlying causes, you can choose to return. The most destructive outcome would be a connection with my worst enemy, a betrayal so cruel that it would make me feel as insignificant as the dirt on someone's shoe. It becomes almost impossible. This makes you doubt the honesty of your own views, that there is a fatal flaw in decision-making, or that you are simply attracted to false personalities. Perhaps you were deceived by this very Delilah who was sweetly communicating with you, plotting your death. This situation does not belong to either the best or the worst options. It is in the middle, where it becomes even more difficult. It involves two betrayals, on the part of your wife and on the part of another person. If the other person is just a golf buddy or someone insignificant, for example, the husband of one of your wife's friends, his betrayal does not matter much. It's just another disrespectful person. But if this person is your father or brother, a close blood relative, then his betrayal may be even more painful than the betrayal of your wife. After all, the wife is not related by blood. And although I may feel angry enough to engage in a physical fight with my brother, in the end, I will most likely prefer to give preference to blood ties and distance myself from a woman. The wife can be replaced, but watching her affair with my best friend captured right on the security monitor, I felt anticipation of their upcoming intimacy. He started an affair with my best friend, Tom, thereby betraying not only our friendship but also my marriage. 
Tom was the best man at my wedding, and I, in turn, shared this role with his younger brother at his own wedding. I was with Sherry for four and a half years, but our friendship with Tom lasted two decades since we were seven years old. He understood perfectly well how important Sherry was in my life, as well as how important marriage commitment and trust were to me. This betrayal deeply hurt me and undermined our once strong relationship. However, the understanding between me and the receptionist was obvious. We shook hands, confirming that our friendship would not be overshadowed by minor misunderstandings, and booze and basketball would not strengthen. I crossed the street and headed for the golf course. There I got in the car and started hitting golf balls. With each swing, my average clubs began to perform perfectly, and the pieces of wood became sharp and precise. The four-iron shot was especially successful. When the ball soared into the air, I enjoyed this moment of pure perfection, savoring the fleeting moments of clarity that make golf such a challenging and exciting game. Feeling a surge of confidence, I decided to call Tom at home. Hey Peg, how are you? I greeted his wife. Great, actually. I'm coming back a little earlier than expected, and I wanted to ask if you and Tom would like to join us for dinner tonight. Oh, do you think we should go somewhere? I asked Tom's wife. I don't mind. How about we meet at Kairos at 7? I suggested. Great. Bye. After that call, I felt like a winner, just like after I crushed four pieces of iron. I called home and left a message saying that I would arrive early and arrange to meet at Kairos at 7. I didn't forget to leave the same message on her mobile phone to make sure she gets it. When I got home at 6, I noticed that Sherry was already in the shower. Her gym bag was lying open on the floor, beckoning me to look inside. Succumbing to curiosity, I couldn't resist rummaging through its contents, hoping to find something remarkable. To my disappointment, there was nothing interesting there. Looking around, my gaze fell on the panties in the basket. Carefully smoothing them out, I examined them for stains and stickiness. To my relief, nothing suspicious was found. Hey, baby, I called through the bathroom door. I need to take a shower too. I'll be out in a minute. It suddenly dawned on me that this might be the last opportunity for intimacy with Sherry before the situation took a turn for the worse. Whatever the future holds, it remains uncertain. Our intimacy was bound to change, no doubt. I wanted to intimately express my love for her, make her really feel the depth of my affection, demonstrate what I gave her, and bring her to a state of bliss. Sherry was breathing heavily, as if she had just completed an energetic run. She took a deep breath and snuggled up to me. It was amazing, she said, her voice filled with satisfaction. We have to make such moments regular. I'm thrilled with how it all happened. Where our lips met in a tender kiss, all doubts that Sherry loves me disappeared. The intensity of this moment spoke volumes. She demonstrated a fiery passion and sincere interest. Although she hesitated at first, she finally gave herself completely to me. Thinking about why I decided to marry her, I realized that I didn't know what steps to take next, as uncertainty clouded my thoughts. When I met Tom and Peg, everything was as usual. Tom and Sherry seemed unaffected by the situation and showed no signs of strangeness. The sincere friendship that we shared as a quartet remained intact, my beloved wife, my closest friend, and my friend's wife. Our bond was unshakable. Sherry's hand laid gently on my leg, her every look was filled with a sense of intimacy. Her demeanor radiated satisfaction. Tom was enthusiastically devouring pasta, and Sherry and Ped were chatting, enjoying a meal together. My gaze never left the plate of chicken, my appetite was fading, and I absentmindedly pressed on a piece of zucchini, making aimless circular movements. The weight of the moment hung in the air. Now is the time. I thought, gathering the courage to voice the urgent question that was bothering me. Sherry sensed my anxiety and gently put her hand back on mine, offering her support. Something's bothering me, I began. There was silence for a moment, and I asked the question that was bothering me. What would you do if you found out that your best friend betrayed you? Silence reigned in the room, anticipation filled the space. What if you found out that your wife was having an affair with your best friend? I continued, with a note of vulnerability in my voice. The silence dragged on heavy, inspired by unspoken emotions. Seriously, I continued, 
my voice flat but with a hint of apprehension. If such a situation happened in your life, what would your actions be? I felt Sherry's hand freeze in mine, her grip tightening slightly. Not calming down, I continued to talk as if discussing the usual topic. You know, this is happening to a friend of mine, I said, and it made me think. You're my best friend. If you found out I was having an affair with Peg, how would you react? Would it hurt you more that it was me or would you justify me? Who would you call to account? A short pause filled the air, allowing my words to sink in. I'm just thinking, I concluded quietly, leaving the question in limbo, waiting for her honest reflection. Witty jokes and witty answers seemed to have remained only in fictional fairy tales. Tom shook his head slowly, a gesture full of disappointment. Sherry looked down at her plate, and her silence spoke volumes. Meanwhile, Peg seemed stunned, her eyes widened in surprise. At that moment, I was determined to convey my message to her. I couldn't help but notice, I said firmly, squeezing Sherry's hand tighter, that you're avoiding us, Tom. It made me wonder if I should resort to violence or take a different approach. The weight of my words hung in the air as I turned to face Sherry. And as for you, my dear, I continued, a mixture of anger and resentment in my tone. Should I throw your unfaithful essence out on the street, or should I choose a more peaceful path and file for divorce? The absence of any response on their part served as a powerful blow, a vivid reminder of the seriousness of the situation. I was well aware of Peg's insight. She understood that if I was joking, Tom would immediately respond with a witty remark. It would be a classic exchange of opinions, a playful farce between us. But Tom's silence spoke volumes, and Peg caught the truth in that split second. Tom realized that he had made a grave mistake, realized that his reaction had betrayed him, and Peg understood it perfectly. He understood that hiding the truth would not be the wisest decision. We need to talk, he began to explain, but before he could finish the sentence, Peg struck him a powerful blow to the face. At such moments, time seemed to stretch out, allowing me to enjoy the moment. Memories came flooding back, for example, about the collision of a school bus with a garage and I captured this chaotic scene in my mind. I remembered our conversations with Tom in his bathroom, where we discussed our infatuations with girls. I imagined us playing ball and fighting the cool wind behind a sturdy oak tree. In an instant, a lot of conversations overwhelmed me, disputes about the greatest runner, about the technique of unbuttoning a bra, the eternal question of who is better to be, a Formula One racer or a movie star. There were curses in the air. You bastard. The sound of Peg's hands hitting him again startled him. In the midst of this horror, I was still holding Sherry's hand. Her grip had frozen. Suddenly, Peg jumped out from behind the table, grabbed her purse, quickly turned on her heel, and hurriedly left. Surprisingly, I remained calm. Could you pay the bill? I asked Tom calmly. You can take the leftovers, I said to Tom, getting up and turning to face my wife. Come on, I said and Sherry gracefully slipped out from behind the table, following me to the car. As we walked, the first words that escaped Sherry's lips were full of remorse. I'm really sorry, she said. I'm really sorry, I answered coldly. Very nice. Are you sorry you got caught? Are you sorry that you hurt me? My anger began to build. Sorry you ruined our marriage? I'm sorry I seduced one of your best friends? I'm sorry that I ruined your old friendship for what? What exactly are you sorry for? I demanded, feeling the full weight of my disappointment. Sherry's tears began to flow, but not in streams, but in real drops running down her cheeks. I kept driving, trying to stay calm. When she plucked up the courage to speak, I raised my hand, signaling her to stop. She instinctively touched her forehead and closed her eyes, choking on sobs. I stopped the car. You can come out, I said firmly. Sherry looked out the window and realized that we were in front of her parents' house. No, she said, almost with a groan. Get out, I warned, tapping the steering wheel impatiently. Disappointment gripped me, and I suddenly flushed. Get out! I shouted, refusing to look at her as I drove away. When I arrived home, my initial plan was to pour myself a strong drink and stupidly watch TV until sleep overcame me but then something clicked in me. 
I opened Sherry's closet, overcome with a lot of emotions and uncertainty, and I fixated on her clothes. I started tearing off hangers with a barbell, desperately grabbing buttons, trying to tear the seams. Anger grew, and I went to the kitchen, returning with a chef's knife. With passion, I cut her clothes forcefully, running a knife through the fabric, cutting and tearing it. Alcohol consumed me, spurring me to action. I impulsively lit a fire in the fireplace and threw our wedding album into the flames. In a rage, I gathered a handful of her underwear, one by one, and threw them into the flames, mesmerized by the sight of each item igniting. After that, I settled down in an armchair and mindlessly watched a classic football match until fatigue overcame me, and I fell asleep. It was agonizing hours when every passing moment was filled with a sense of significance, but none of them brought comfort. I was crushed, feeling a magnetic attraction to the dark side of my emotions. Now I understood what auto-suggestion and the destructive tendencies of jealous people were. I saw that beneath the surface of love, there was anger that had taken equally deep roots. The coming morning brought with it a sense of calm, the house looked clean except for the mess in the bedroom. The remnants of Sherry's torn clothes lay on the floor in disarray around our closet. I left them there along with the remains in the fireplace, the charred base of our wedding album, the remains of burnt bras, and the remnants of the ties of a nightgown. There was a void in my head, there was not a single coherent thought in it. Consumed by anger, I went to the shower, and the water cascaded over me. At that moment, memories of our intimate moments of the previous night flashed through my head. I realized that my life had changed irreversibly, but I couldn't understand why. It didn't matter much to me. In connection with the latest event, I decided to talk directly with Tom about the current situation. I called him on his mobile, and to my surprise, he answered, apologizing. He admitted that it was all the result of a harmless flirtation that got out of control. He assured me that there was nothing else, but he admitted that he once ran into her at the mall, and then everything escalated. It was an impulsive mistake, which he deeply regrets. Listening to him, I felt that he wanted to say something else, and I waited patiently. It became clear that both of them never wanted Peg and me to find out about this. They couldn't resist their attraction, and it continued despite their guilt. At the same moment, a decision matured in me. I knew exactly what to do in this situation. I decided that I never wanted to see him again. Our friendship has come to an end. I don't care what happens between you and Peg, you're completely out of my life. You don't exist in my world anymore. Goodbye, Tom. With these last words, I abruptly cut off the call while Tom was talking. At that moment when Tom sincerely said that he never wanted to hurt me, I felt the truth in his words. He succumbed to his own weaknesses and took the wrong path. The betrayal is deep, and it is obvious that our friendship cannot be restored. I was left to drown without a lifeline because Tom chose to betray me. Without warning Sherry's parents, I headed for their house. When I knocked on the door, her father opened it, his expression expressing sadness and anxiety. How are you holding up? I asked, worried, stepping out onto the porch. He partially closed the door behind him. Inside, heavily, he told us. He admitted, and there was a dark note in his voice. You know she loves you, right? You should know that, looking for some sign of understanding in my eyes. He shook his head again. How stupid she is. It's unbelievable that I resort to such derogatory expressions when it comes to my own daughter. Stupid, I can't realize that I'm saying these words to her. But it's stupid, the meeting was clear, despite his scattered thoughts, he was fully aware of what he was saying. Sherry made a mistake, a significant but still just a mistake. With effort and with the passage of time, we could step over it. Stupidity, stupidly, the name calling may continue, but we have to overcome it. Will you let me in? I asked Sherry's father. My stupid daughter is in the kitchen, sitting down at the kitchen table, I didn't know what to say. Sherry looked pale, her eyes swollen from crying. Her mother stood silently beside her, and her father drank water from a glass in small sips. Taking a deep breath, I finally spoke, outlining my decision. Here's what I've decided, I began, and Sherry nodded, her expression reflecting the pain I'd felt the day before. I'm going to file for divorce. There's no point in discussing the possibility of saving this marriage. The weight of her betrayal hung in the air. 
You betrayed me, our marriage, and everything I thought was human in you. I've made a firm decision, I don't want to be married to you anymore. When she started suppressing her tears and crying, I remained indifferent. The pain you have caused me is immeasurable, and I doubt that you will ever understand the scale of what you have done. I know about your love for me, and it is because of this love that I decide to divorce you. I want you to feel the pain of losing me and live with this burden. In a moment of emotional excitement, she made a beastly sound. It's really disturbing how similar the sounds we make in moments of pain are to the sounds of pleasure. But let me clarify my further intentions. Are you listening, Sherry? I asked, wanting to get at least some confirmation. Sherry didn't answer verbally but lowered her head, which meant a silent yes. As soon as the divorce is finalized, and this will not happen soon, we will be able to consider the possibility of resuming the relationship. But there is one condition, if you prove that you are a good person, we can start dating again. I looked into Sherry's eyes, noticing the sadness and pain written on her face. I want you to understand that I once loved you, and now I'm giving you the opportunity to make me fall in love with you again. But I want to let you know that I'm not going back. This marriage is now part of history. If you really love me, you should do your best to get me back. Only in this case will I consider that I have something with you. Sherry nodded, her lips pressed tightly together as if she was pondering the weight of my words. Tom was no longer considered my friend during the divorce. I hardly spoke to Sherry, we sold our apartment, and Sherry went to live with her parents while I was looking for an apartment. I saw her father only a few times, and these conversations were casual and superficial. I didn't ask about Sherry, but in these meetings, I made it clear that the agreement remains in force. The divorce was officially finalized in just four months, a little less than the time that Sherry spent in an affair with Tom. Peg came to me twice after the fight in the restaurant, having said that she is no longer part of my life and therefore will also be excluded. I told Peg about the divorce from Sherry. I pointed out that I would consider starting a new life with Sherry only if she moved away from both Tom and her own actions. To my surprise, Peg didn't try to contact me again. Instead, through mutual acquaintances, I found out that she and Tom are seeking advice about their relationship. I went on a vacation full of adventures, doing active sports such as hiking and rock climbing in Chile. Physical activity served as a good remedy for me, completely clearing my mind. On my return, I saw a message from Sherry on my work answering machine asking about our conversation. As I was riding in a taxi heading home from the airport, I decided to call her. I dialed her number and greeted her with a casual hello. The whole affair with infidelity and divorce forced me to be more direct in my actions. I wondered if she was going to call after informing her about my recent return to the city. I asked if we were going to continue this conversation. I offered to meet and asked when she would be ready. What are you doing this afternoon? Do you want a drink? I suggested. When I arrived at the indicated place, I saw that she was waiting in a booth, putting a glass of water in front of her. I sat down and joined her. Our eyes met, and I nodded her greeting. I decided not to waste words, getting straight to the point. Will we discuss this further? Is there anything you want to say or suggest? I asked, genuinely interested in her intentions. I want to give this a chance, I added, emphasizing my desire to move forward. Curious about her own desires, I asked, what do you want, leaving no room for ambiguity? I felt the tension building up inside her. She closed her eyes for a moment, perhaps considering her next words. Should I apologize? What is it? She finally asked, seeking advice on what to do. I also have to say that I'm expecting a baby. My eyes immediately fell on Sherry's stomach, and as I did not notice that her dress was not in her style, it was very wide, probably in order to hide the pregnancy. The problem is that I do not know whose child it is. After saying this in a whisper, Sherry began to cry. I couldn't utter a word from the state of shock. Silently, I took her by the hand and took her to the clinic to do a DNA test. I was so confused by this unexpected news that I couldn't even think rationally. Does Tom know about your pregnancy? In a trembling voice, she replied that Tom had ignored her pregnancy message. I was ready to strangle this pathetic bastard. We were silent the rest of the way to the clinic. After doing a DNA test, I took Sherry to her parents, and I was looking forward to the next day. Almost all night, 
I couldn't sleep, tossing and turning in bed. In the afternoon, I got a call from the clinic and was informed that the DNA test result was ready. I quickly got into the car and drove to the clinic, and what I found out was incredibly sick. I was not the father of the unborn child. For about an hour, I sat in the car, sobbing in pain. It's all settled now. Sherry and I can't be together anymore, and I told her this news by writing a text message, also attaching a photo of the DNA test result. When I sent this message, there were endless calls from Sherry, but I didn't want to talk to her or see her anymore. I also made a serious decision to buy a house away from Sherry and Tom to forget the past once and for all. Seven months have passed since I blocked Sherry and all managers. I bought a small house and try not to remember the past with Sherry. My work in sports helped me in this. I have a girlfriend with whom we see on weekends from work and have a great time together, but I don't want anything serious yet. I recently learned about the fate of Sherry and her child from my parents, and I cried for a long time, unable to overcome the pain. After my message, Sherry became hysterical, which turned into a deep depression. She refused even to eat, spending whole days in bed. Because of such an emotional breakdown, she gave birth to a girl prematurely, but the child was born with a diagnosis of Down syndrome. Now Sherry is raising a child alone, living with parents who help her in everything. Story 2 On that fateful August day in 2005, my friend, a high school graduate at the tender age of 18, burst into the door of our cozy two-room apartment, and I could not believe our incredible luck. The dream of her whole life to become an actress has always seemed quite feasible to me, thanks to her undeniable beauty and extraordinary talent. This was not surprising given her bright cheerleading past and active participation in various school drama productions throughout her school years. Taking into account that the whole future lay ahead, the acting profession seemed to her quite an achievable reality. While my girlfriend had always been determined to make a career as an actress, I was still contemplating the direction of my life. I wasn't very interested in college and was content working at McDonald's, giving my girlfriend the opportunity to take the initiative. But that day was the turning point. Overwhelmed with delight, she broke the news that she had received a minor role in the acclaimed blockbuster film. It was an incredible event. Although she only uttered two phrases, it felt like a monumental leap towards the realization of her dream. She said that the main role in this fantastic chance is played by a customer from the Hooters restaurant, who promised her a role and even booked a ticket to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I undoubtedly believed in the opportunity that had opened up, despite my naivety. I refrained from asking how she managed to get such a wonderful chance. In the evening, we gathered with friends to enjoy this event. Every moment, we were getting closer to the charm and splendor of Hollywood. Wanting me to join her on this journey, she contacted a mysterious sponsor who kindly purchased a ticket for me as well. The happiness she radiated was contagious, and I had never seen her in such a happy state before. Upon arrival in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we were greeted with luxury. When we checked into a luxurious hotel for four days, the sensations were simply exhilarating. Two of those days, my girlfriend was busy shooting her scenes, but I didn't mind. I took full advantage of this opportunity, immersed in the atmosphere of stunning beaches and basking in the warm rays of the sun. The remaining days were like a continuous vacation, filled with beach excursions, fun parties, and even meetings with celebrities who participated in the filming of the film. It was like a dream come true. All this served as an impetus that strengthened our desire for a glamorous lifestyle that cinema offered. When we returned to Pennsylvania, the alluring world did not leave us. We knew perfectly well that now our way lay to Los Angeles, where my friend could wholeheartedly realize her dreams in the film business. Her time in St. Vincent and the Grenadines allowed her to make valuable connections with influential people. Moreover, she shared her belief that as soon as we returned to Pennsylvania, we should use the $15,300 we received to go on this amazing journey. Using part of her earnings from a movie role, we managed to rent a modest apartment in Los Angeles. Full of hope and anticipation, we were entering a new chapter of our lives. Days turned into months, and my girlfriend had the difficult task of finding meaningful movie roles in this bustling city. Every morning, she got up early and went to auditions in the hope of a long-awaited breakthrough. Unfortunately, she came across mostly minor roles in advertising for local businesses, for which a meager reward was offered, which did not meet our expectations. 
when the funds accumulated from her role in an amazing film began to dry up, we were faced with the need to invest in new clothes and photos for auditions. Realizing that I needed to provide for myself, I decided to get a job at a fast food restaurant. Maybe it wasn't glamorous, but it gave us an opportunity to start making money and support our existence. As our savings decreased, I watched her hopes and dreams gradually fade in her eyes. Every evening, we returned home burdened with the burden of refusals and disappointments because she had experienced the harsh reality and fierce competition of the film industry in Los Angeles. In our small Pennsylvania town, she was considered the epitome of beauty, but in this sprawling city, beauty was commonplace. Months turned into almost a year, and she still could not find a decent role for herself. The clothes she bought were only handmade, and the opportunities for promotion seemed doubtful. In the end, she got a job as a model in a shopping mall, which seemed to be a significant deviation from our lofty plans. Nevertheless, it allowed, albeit with difficulty, to pay the bills. Meanwhile, during this period, I discovered my own path in life as a fitness trainer. Juggling two jobs, one in a restaurant, the other training numerous clients, I sought to provide stability and support. Our lives were consumed by individual pursuits, and as a result, we rarely found time for each other. Our dreams of success in the show business industry seemed to be drifting away, absorbed by the demands of our hectic life. With each passing day, the dreams seemed to be moving further away from us. The cruel nature of the film and entertainment industry severely undermined the spirit of my girlfriend, and I could only watch helplessly as she faced the bitter reality that achieving success in Hollywood is far from the easy dream that we once realized. Over time, her excessive spending completely devastated our finances, and we began to struggle to make ends meet. I was getting more and more annoyed with her for emptying our savings at an appalling rate. Finally, we were able to restore our depleted savings unexpectedly when I was rummaging in her purse looking for something and came across a bundle of $1,500. Intrigued, I couldn't help but ask her where she got so much money. She was confused but said that the photographer whom she met at the mall invited her to take pictures in his luxurious mansion. I couldn't resist asking why she didn't tell me about it earlier, to which she replied that she was going to but somehow forgot. Curiosity got to me, and I continued my inquiries, wanting to make sure that this photo shoot was real. She firmly stated that everything was fine when she talked about her best photos in which she poses in various outfits made by professional photographers. Doubts began to enter my mind despite our naive understanding of this industry. I could not ignore doubts about the possibility of exploitation or ill intentions. After all, we've heard stories that people in Hollywood are willing to pay exorbitant amounts for almost anything. I was curious and asked her to show me the photos. To my surprise, she said that producers rarely provide copies, and it would take time before something becomes known about the shoot. In my naivety, I accepted her explanation without delving into the essence of the question. This situation persisted for the next two years. She often came home late at night claiming that she earns money by visiting clubs and taking VIP seats. She constantly said that her participation in the project was reduced to gatherings in the VIP section. In other cases, she explained that some producers prefer to audition and shoot scenes at night. But as her nocturnal adventures became more frequent, a sense of anxiety settled in me. I began to be overwhelmed by thoughts about her safety and the company she was keeping. She tried to dispel my fears trying to convince me that she is not the only one engaged in such activities, that many of her friends also receive compensation under similar schemes. But suspicions began to come to my head, making me doubt the reality of her actions. Over time, I drew attention to the company she was keeping. Mostly, they were people who are usually associated with the adult film industry, but in my naivety, I thought they were just models. She defended herself by saying that she did not control her work schedule, since it was the producers who dictated her location and duties. I tried to logically assess the situation, convincing myself that some producers might really prefer to shoot at night, and all this logically lined up in my mind with my limited knowledge of this industry. One day, when I was taking a smoke break near our apartment, a turning point occurred that shattered my illusions. A man in a large SUV drove up and dropped her off right in front of our house. At that moment, my views on her nocturnal adventures were questioned, which shocked me. Stunned by what I saw, I could not summon the courage to immediately enter into an argument with her. Instead, 
I went into the house and discreetly watched through the blinds as she entered. It was at this moment that I was seized with anxiety and made a firm decision to reveal the truth about her activities. I decided to secretly follow her the next Friday when she went out. On Friday, she went on a date with her friends, and I quietly began to follow her. In the end, she came to the club where a long queue formed. To my surprise, the club's promoter granted my girlfriend and her friends special privileges, allowing them to pass through the long queue and quickly enter the premises of the establishment. Deciding to get to the bottom of the truth, I was forced to generously bribe a bouncer to secure my entrance. Entering the club, I scanned the crowd carefully, desperately looking for her presence. Finally, I saw her in the VIP section, talking animatedly and enjoying drinks with her friends, as she described earlier. There was nothing suspicious. I stayed there for a while, gradually getting tired until eventually, when I was preparing to leave, I was still tormented by doubts about the man in the SUV. But my doubts quickly dissipated when I realized that it was just an uber black and I felt stupid because of the suspicion of treason. After scolding myself for being paranoid, I convinced myself that everything was fine and returned to my usual lifestyle. At that time, I was working as a fitness trainer and engaged in multi-level marketing, selling dietary supplements and insurance. Fortunately, my average earnings were enough to pay rent and provide for my livelihood. When I took responsibility for managing my own finances, I couldn't help but notice changes in my girlfriend's behavior and appearance. She became more secretive about her money matters, which caused me concern. Sometimes she showed aggression towards me, but then apologized, claiming that it was unintentional. In addition, she began to hide her finances and not pay proper attention to her expenses which caused me to wonder about her spending habits. Despite the fact that at first I tried to dismiss these concerns, I could not ignore the fact that her financial stability had deteriorated markedly. She began to lose a lot of weight, hardly ate, showed signs of excessive vigilance, and had sleep problems. She often slept for a long time, which caused me concern for her well-being. Trying to solve her health problem, I made sure that she ate right, believing that her behavior was caused by stress. But one day, when I woke up at night, I saw that she was not in our bed. Puzzled by this, I followed the noise coming from the bathroom, driven by a sense of anxiety. To my horror, I saw that my girlfriend was using a prohibited substance in the bathroom. I came across a handful of illegal substances, which caught my girlfriend by surprise. In a panic, she tried to hastily hide everything, but eventually scattered it on the floor. Her desperate attempts to save the substance resembled the plea of a desperate beggar clutching its scattered money. It was a turning point in our relationship. Overwhelmed with emotion, we both burst into tears. She sincerely apologized and promised to immediately seek help and undergo rehabilitation. There was a feeling that she had traveled all the way to Los Angeles but had lost not only herself but also our connection with her. I didn't know yet that this case was the beginning of a sharp turn in the life of a young promising girl who dreamed of becoming a movie star. Without hiding her problems, she courageously fulfilled her promise and went to a rehabilitation center the very next day. Throughout her month-long stay in the clinic, she showed genuine remorse and sincerity, clinging to the hope of overcoming this dark stage and regaining her dream. When my girlfriend finally finished the rehabilitation course and returned home, she looked rejuvenated with new strength and determination. A wave of relief swept over me. Her return was very important to me, especially since my birthday was just around the corner. We had a tradition of arranging everything possible for each other's birthday, constantly trying to outdo each other to make the holiday unforgettable. One day, she came home and casually threw her purse next to me, then went to the bathroom. Curiosity got the better of me, and a few days before my birthday, I decided to rummage in her bag. To my surprise, I came across a CD with the inscription pilot, and I was overwhelmed with excitement and anticipation. Without hesitation, I inserted it into the DVD player, wanting to know its contents, expecting it to be a surprise related to me or maybe a recording of a screen test she attended. I was in complete shock and anger at the unexpected truth that unfolded on the screen. The footage showed that my girlfriend was engaged in intimate activity with a man. It was a sight I couldn't imagine. Flushed with emotions, I burst into the bathroom where she was taking a shower and vented my anger, demanding an immediate explanation of her participation in such actions. When she got out of the shower, I noticed that she was shaking, and I heard her sincere apologies. 
she admitted that what I witnessed was originally intended as a one-time action but suddenly got out of control. I could hardly comprehend her words, feeling confused and incredulous. In search of clarity, I asked her how long she had been working in this industry, and she reluctantly admitted that it was a one-time engagement lasting more than a year. My confusion only intensified when she could hardly count exactly how many times she had participated in the project, noting that the frequency of participation blurred the boundaries and made it difficult to keep track. I was even more struck by the fact that the dates and time stamps on the videos coincided with the period when she was supposed to be in a rehabilitation center, where, as I believed, she was looking for help. Instead, she was passionate about making adult films for financial gain. She admitted that her fascination with illegal drugs led her to this dark path and explained what she spent her money on. The severity of her addiction became unbearable, and I realized with pain that I could not solve her problems alone. It was with a heavy heart that I made the difficult decision to end the relationship. I packed up my things, carrying a load of sadness and disappointment. I decided to move out of our apartment, finding shelter with a friend. Having decided to rebuild my life, I cut off all contacts with my ex-girlfriend and switched my attention to a career as a fitness trainer and a multi-level marketer. By doing the latter, I managed to accumulate a significant amount of money, but my hopes were dashed when it turned out that the company was a pyramid scheme and was subsequently closed by the authorities. Without thinking twice, I decided to invest my savings in opening a gym, but the exorbitant expenses in California proved to be a serious obstacle. Having decided to join the Planet Fitness franchise, I took the opportunity to open a small gym in my hometown in Pennsylvania before leaving California. Wanting to be as open as possible, I contacted my ex-girlfriend to inform her of my departure. Despite the fact that we broke up six months ago, our connection remained strong, and during the phone conversation, emotions overwhelmed both of us. We spoke about the feeling of abandonment, emphasizing that I brought her to California and then abandoned her when she needed me most. Her words left me speechless and now I was immersed in memories of our shared youth and dreams that we once saw together. Having decided to return to my hometown, I took the initiative to create the Planet Fitness Center. When the business started to flourish, I also found solace in close relationships that brought joy and satisfaction back into my life. But over time, I heard disturbing rumors that my ex-girlfriend had started a career as a woman who sells herself, standing on the streets to purchase illegal substances. Not believing it, I decided to investigate and find out the truth firsthand. What I encountered shocked me to the core. The person I once knew was now just a shell devoid of the living soul I once treasured. About two years after the opening of my gym, the situation took an unexpected turn. Everything was going smoothly for me, the number of members in my gym was constantly growing, and it seemed that life was developing positively. But then, unexpected and terrifying news reached me. My ex-girlfriend died when she was with a client and consumed too much of a prohibited substance. The moment I received this heartbreaking information, goosebumps ran down my spine, and I hurriedly headed home. Unable to contain my emotions, I sat on the floor in the shower, overcome by uncontrollable grief and tears. To this day, I still feel guilty, and I never stop wondering if I could have done something else. Despite the assurances of my therapist, pain and regret continue to weigh on my heart.